السلام عليكم السلام السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon all prophets especially our master the holy prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate ahlul bayt We've been discussing some of the philosophies behind the month of Ramadan. And during the last one or two nights, we said that this is a divine invitation. An invitation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. An invitation to acquire proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order to acquire this proximity to God, one has to tame one's animal dimension. One has to reduce and lower one's animalistic attributes. The lesser the animal side, the lesser the animal dimension, predominates over one, the more one can transcend to the metaphysical realms. All religions from the very beginning, all religions were always of the belief that the I, the I, the first person singular, when you say, I am this, or I am studying, I am going somewhere. All religions and faiths, they appreciate and have acknowledged that the I substantially is different by essence to the physical body. The physical body is one dimension of the I, but the I itself is something immaterial. That doesn't mean there's no relationship between the immaterial I and the physical body. And actually we believe that there exists a unity between body and soul. And we'll speak about that another day in Shama. And modern medicine also supports this fact. But the I is something immaterial and is essentially different to the physical body. All religions have that. Also, all religions have paid attention and have put significance to the fact that human beings have to focus on the immaterial dimension of their existence and not to be drowned in the physical realm of existence or in their physical dimensions. Otherwise, they wouldn't be much different to animals. And in the Holy Quran, the prescriptions that are given, they mainly are focused on paying attention to the self, to the immaterial soul. وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْسِلُونَ And in yourselves, don't you see? Now this seeing within, and this seeing in your souls, it's not a physical seeing. It's not a seeing with a physical eye. But there is a seeing. And that seeing is immaterial. What this physical eye sees are physical things. But if we want to witness and see immaterial truths of ourselves and immaterial truths of the cosmos, that requires a seeing other than 
the physical seeing. In order for that seeing to happen, the key is to detach from the physical realm of existence. The key is to detach from the worldly life. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to lead a monastic life, although leading a monastic life isn't bad. And actually, it's been given the green light in the Holy Quran. However, humans and the way the Quran has prescribed human perfection, it wants people to lead a normal life at the same time as being with the people and living in society, at the same time to detach from the worldly life. So you can live in a house, have a car, job, work, study, and do occupy yourself in society. But at the same time, it wants you to recall Allah in all things. Detaching from the worldly life doesn't have to mean you don't live in a house or you don't have a car, you don't associate with people. That's only one interpretation. Many people, maybe when they associate into society, they may lose their faith. If they want to detach, that's okay. Some people, faiths of people, the Iman of people is at different ranges. Some people are weaker than others. Some people may suddenly lose faith when they associate or socialize with certain people or enter certain places. Some people may lose their faith when they hear of an earthquake. People's faith, you know, it's a gradational theme. Some are strong, some are weak. If someone is weak, they're not to be blamed were they not to want to socialize with others. If they lead a monastic or an introverted life, we shouldn't judge those kind of people. However, the ideal, the ideal is that we have to be with the people and the reason for that is many attributes of perfection within ourselves won't be actualized if we don't associate with the people. For example, the power to forgive. If you don't socialize with anyone from morning to night, when will you ever learn to forgive others? You have to be with people. You have to encounter vice, oppression, and people's differing negative attitudes so that then you can learn to be patient, you can learn to forgive, and so on and so forth. So, being with the people, it's important for one's perfection and one's growth. Now, in Islam, when it speaks of detaching from the worldly life, it doesn't mean detaching from people, detaching from the jobs, education, and other worldly things. After all, the world is good. Nothing is wrong with the world. Whatever is created has to be good. Because whatever is, is a manifestation of God. God is manifesting. God is never manifestation-less. Whatever is, is Him in dimension. Moment to moment, all manifestations, from pre-eternity to post-eternity, it's Him, it's Allah, in dimension. Nothing is Allah-free. Nothing is Godless. Everything, it's Him manifesting Himself. So the world is good. Whatever is, has to be good. 
However, the worldly life doesn't mean the world is bad or anything. When Islam speaks about detaching from the worldly life, what it means is that you never get drowned in the worldly causes making you oblivious to the one true cause which is God. What do I mean? For example, when you go to school and the teacher teaches you and you thank the teacher, of course, but what happens usually is we see the teacher as giving us knowledge. Period. Whereas it's God who is giving us knowledge. God is the true cause. But we see the physical causes, the teacher for example, and that makes us oblivious to God. Otherwise the teacher isn't a God less existent. Whatever exists, it's God full. Whatever is, is wholly dependent on Allah. Knowledge without Allah is not possible. When our belief in God is that He is absolute perfection, there's no room for limitation anymore. He is absolute perfection in all areas, knowledge, power, life, and all other attributes. Any attribute of knowledge, power, that we see in this world, it's a manifestation of the manifestations of that absolute perfection. That existence, pure existence, which existed pre-eternally and will exist post-eternally, which is infinite, not limited by time or place. But we see the teacher as the cause. Or for example, when we go to the grocery and we thank the grocer, we see the grocer as the source of sustenance. And it's okay to thank them. But detaching from the worldly life means don't be oblivious to the fact that it's Allah who is providing sustenance. Don't get detached, don't get attached rather to the grocer. Don't get attached to the teacher. Don't be oblivious to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or when you put the alarm on in your car, don't see the, the alarm device as that which is protecting your car. It's God who is the protector. If you analyze all the events that you face on a daily routine, from when you wake up and brush your teeth until you go and sleep, the thousands of causes, worldly causes, that you encounter in this world, if you look at those causes in and of themselves, you become attached to them, to these worldly causes. And that makes you oblivious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And detachment, in its real sense, means that in all your encounters on a daily routine, you appreciate and acknowledge that it all emanates from Allah. Because God, by definition, what the theologians call God, the philosophers call it pure existence. God is pure existence. And whatever is, cannot be existence-free. Nothing can be God-free. And that's why we believe evil does not exist. 
whatever it is, it's good. And sometimes certain events happen and people's faith shake a bit. It's because we interpret those events with an egoistic interpretation. As if humans are the be-all and end-all of everything and any kind of loss of human life has to be a bad thing. It doesn't matter if animals die, plants die and everything. When it comes to humans though, their faiths shake when certain events happen and that's because of an egoistic approach to life. Otherwise, whatever is, is manifesting that pure existence. There's no superiority of one existent over the other, superiority of any existent only lies when you manifest the attributes of that absolute perfection more. The more you manifest it, the more superior you become. The less you manifest it, the less superior. And therefore it's possible that someone may be inferior to animals or even inferior to plants on a spiritual level. Detaching from the worldly life, therefore, is a key to spiritual wayfaring in Islam. In order to enhance one's spiritual growth, the animal dimension has to be tamed, has to be controlled. The more one is attached to the world they love, this is a symptom of one's animalistic tendencies predominating over one. But the less one is attached to the world they love, that's a sign of good spirituality. So for example, if you write a book, you wrote this book, you're the author, and then someone comes and steals your book and then puts his or her name on the book and then publishes it. Would you be disappointed or not? And if so, how disappointed? If you were someone who is absorbed in the worldly life, absorbed in the worldly causes, yes, you would be disappointed because there's no God in your endeavor in writing that book. But when you write something for God's sake, it doesn't matter what happens to it. Yes, you have a right to retaliate and so on and so forth. But I'm speaking on a spiritual level here. There's, there would be no need to be disappointed because you know the ultimate cause is God. Okay, someone else has stolen it. It doesn't matter what people think. It's because of your being drowned in the worldly causes then you become disappointed. But someone with a true godly world of view where it's all him in dimension, if that is incorporated within one, that's a very important step. To do that, you have to cut from the worldly life. To help you do that, you have to tame your animalistic dimension. You have to tame the animal side. In the holy month of Ramadan, although this philosophy approved exists throughout the year, but in this month in particular, it's a month of training the soul. Training the soul to tame the animal dimension. And that's why for a set number of hours, you're not allowed to eat, you're not allowed to drink, no sex. These animalistic things, they're to be eliminated for a set number of hours. The purpose being to tame your animal dimension and therefore facilitating your movement, your immaterial movement to the metaphysical dimension. And that 
that's very important. Until that happens, you're just like animals. Your spiritual growth is at a minimum. But once that true detachment arises, you start seeing. And you start seeing, not in the physical sense, and not with the physical eye, you start seeing metaphysically. To explain that, the example of dreams is usually given. When you sleep, sleep by sleeping, you automatically, not intentionally, but you automatically, by sleeping, you detach from the worldly life. When you're asleep, there's no burden, there's no, there's no stress, there's no worry. If you're in debt or if you have exams or if someone passed away or you were grieving for whatever reason, when you're asleep, you detach from all these worldly causes. And what happens when you detach, when you sleep? The immaterial eye awakens and transcends. And you start seeing things. What you see in your dreams, there's nothing physical in your dreams. In this physical realm of existence, it's all physical. And it's infinite. There's no end to the physical realm of existence. But this physical realm of existence has a metaphysical dimension too, which has nothing to do with the physical dimension. It's metaphysical. There's no matter. To understand that in your dreams, we all experience dreams. And in your dreams, actually, it's all metaphysical. There's nothing physical in your dreams. Even the food that you eat, and the things that you drink, and the people that you shake hands with, and the thousands of other actions that you do, there's nothing physical about that. You're eating, it's not physical food. You're drinking, it's not physical water. But all these actions exist. It's in a metaphysical realm. But you slept, when you slept, automatically you became detached. And when you became detached, the soul now starts seeing immaterial truths. And what happens is that the soul transcends to timeless, placeless, matterless realms of existence. The soul transcends. Be you Muslim or non-Muslim, it doesn't matter. Everyone undergoes this reality. And on sleeping, since you've detached from the worldly life, the soul now ascends. Ascends not to another physical place, ascends to immaterial realms of existence. The purer the soul, the data that it becomes a recipient of when it transcends the immaterial realms of existence, the purer the soul, the clearer the messages will be. And this is something which is an important goal in Islamic spiritual wayfaring. And the key is detachment from the worldly life, but not when you're asleep. When you're awake, mm -hmm. you detach from the world in life. Because when you're asleep, it happens automatically. Even though in, in Islam, Islam wants to make humans out of you. If you sleep like animal sleep, a biological sleep, then that's not going to be much of an endeavor. But Islam comes and gives a protocol of action. When you sleep, recite certain supplications. 
when you sleep, beside certain verses of the Holy Quran. When you sleep, do the wudu, the ceremonial ablution, before sleeping. All this is in preparation for this sleep that you want to do. Because in your sleep, a pure soul will ascend purely and receive knowledge purely. So to stop you in your sleep, the aim is to acquire knowledge directly from Allah, rather than from the pulpit or the teacher. And we spoke about that yesterday. In the Holy Quran, there are many stories which highlight this reality. One is in relation to Lady Maria, Lady Mary, alayhi salam, peace be upon her. Here, Lady Mary, in the Quran, there's one story where she, as a result of her detaching from the people, the Quran then speaks of Fatamathala Laha Basharan Sawiya that in unity with her Archangel Gabriel appeared in unity with her before her Archangel Gabriel appeared as a well proportioned perfect human being now this is an apparition, it's a tamathur, it wasn't a physical reality. Archangel Gabriel isn't a physical reality, it's an angel. This angel appeared before Lady Maria as a human being, but it wasn't physical. Because of her piety, because of her chastity, after all, Lady Mary was masoon. She was infallible. And she never married. And she was never touched to the very end. Why, why is there reason to marry when there is no man who is of her spiritual caliber? After all, marriage in Islam, it's a holy endeavor. You marry to get closer to Allah. That's the philosophy behind permanent marriages. It's to get closer to Allah. That's why when you want to marry, there are certain prerequisites and criteria. But if your spirituality is going to be compromised by marrying, there's no need to marry. Lady Mary, was Maksum, she was infallible. There was no man of her caliber, save for her son, Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. But she wouldn't marry, and she never married until the very end. She was infallible. In the Quran, there are many stories in relation to her. One of them, as a result of her detaching from the worldly life, she sees Archangel Gabriel and she was awake. If me and you were standing beside her, when she was seeing Archangel Gabriel, we wouldn't have seen anything because Archangel Gabriel wasn't a physical being. We would have just stood there seeing nothing. But she was awake. She wasn't asleep. Her spirituality was acquired. And then she detaches and she sees the metaphysical realm. And she sees Archangel Gabriel as in a particular form. For example, when you sleep, your dreams are a product of your soul. When you see your dreams in your sleep, the person besides you, they don't see anything. Why? Because your dreams are a product of your soul. Your dreams are in unity with you. The person next to you, whether they're asleep or awake, when you're dreaming, they don't have access to your dreams. 
these apparitions that holy people see and the Quran wants us also to see and is inviting us to see otherwise we'll be just like animals it's this it, the products of the soul a pure soul will see after detaching from the world in life but it's in unity with their soul and when you're awake and you're seeing other people there won't be able to see it's your endeavor that you're seeing and therefore she saw Archangel Gabriel and Archangel Gabriel gave her a lot of data of things that would have to happen in the future the Christians have this story in their Bible and actually they also see this as an apparition not something physical we too believe that although there are some Islamic theologians who believe it was a physical reality but that's not what the the Orafa, the mystics believe this was an apparition and there are many stories in relation to Lady Mary each of them deserve a lot of significance and attention the whole philosophy of the Friday prayer that Muslims have it's all indebted to burdens that Lady Mary underwent on a Friday afternoon and these Friday prayers that we have it's in remembrance partly of such a holy lady in any case the Quran puts attention and emphasizes that we have to pay attention to our immaterial dimension this is important but we can't focus and we can't focus and be attentive and be mindful of ourselves if we're drowned in the physical realm and therefore in the month of Ramadan the aim is to tame the animal dimension the more that is tamed the more access you will have to transcend metaphysical realms because the essence of fasting the essence of fasting is tantamount to a tranquil silence a tranquil inner silence as the tradition to say it's an inner silence that's the essence of fasting and actually another story of the Holy Quran Lady Mary again she makes a vow of fasting she said that verily I am going to make a vow before Allah a vow of fasting Salma then the verse continues Fa lan yawma in therefore I shan't speak with anyone any human today fasting the essence of fasting and fasting existed in all religions from pre-eternity and will always exist in all religions post-eternity the inner core of fasting is inner silence that has to be acquired yes this inner silence manifests differently from religion to religion from Sharia to Sharia at the time of Lady Mary 2000 years ago there the Sharia request required that you don't speak with people for a certain amount of time when they would fast they wouldn't speak we don't have that today in our Sharia but the spirit of fasting still persists and that is that inner silence that inner silence 2000 years ago in the Sharia of 2000 years ago manifested 
partly by not speaking with anyone. Today, it's manifested in Islam by taming the animal dimension and not being drowned in the physical causes. If that happens, you will acquire inner tranquility. If inner tranquility arises, then you begin to see. Does one have knowledge of the metaphysical, of the unseen, so that one qualifies as a seer? Otherwise, if you only see physically, you're not qualified as a true seer. And that's the aim of Islam. It wants you to see and benefit, and only then, Proximity to God has meaning. Before that, one is static. Inshallah, we'll speak about this more in the future. Allah.